Many experts agree that right now, SpaceX's Starship is our best shot at getting humans to Mars, thanks to its insane capabilities. But Elon Musk's plan to colonize Mars isn't perfect. It's missing a lot of important details and seems a bit too optimistic about some major challenges. Take fuel, for example. How exactly are we supposed to produce enough to get that massive spacecraft back to Earth from Mars? But what if I told you it might not be that complicated? Recently, a new research proposal came out that offers a surprisingly simple solution to one of the biggest problems in the Starship Mars plan. Just one clever trick, and suddenly, things get a whole lot easier. Feel curious yet? Then let's find out. The research has a very straightforward name, Human Missions to Mars Using the Starship. At the beginning of the research, the author highlights how earlier NASA missions were fundamentally constrained by the cost of launching material into space. Because of these limits, mission designs were narrow in scope and had to make trade-offs that prioritized mass above almost everything else. For instance, robotic Mars missions could only explore very limited areas, usually just a few kilometers, with maybe 20 kilometers at best. Even our orbital observations, while broad in coverage, lacked the resolution needed for detailed surface studies. A good example is the gamma-ray spectrometer aboard the Mars Odyssey spacecraft, which was instrumental in detecting near-surface hydrogen. But its data came with a spatial resolution of about 550 kilometers per pixel, far too coarse for precision planning or exploration. At that time, launch costs were high and every kilogram mattered. This gave rise to mission concepts designed around minimizing mass at all costs. The author points out that much of the thinking was driven by what's called the Initial Mass in Low Earth Orbit, or IMLEO, which effectively became the central design constraint. To work within these tight margins, proposals included Nuclear Thermal Propulsion, NTP, In Situ Resource Utilization, ISRU, to create fuel on Mars, and Sophisticated Recycling Systems for Air and Water. While these ideas were ambitious and creative, none of them could be called practical or affordable. The result was that human missions to Mars stayed theoretical. Complex paper studies that, despite decades of work, weren't moving toward real-world execution. But the situation may be changing. The author argues that the arrival of SpaceX's Starship could shift the paradigm. With its promise of lifting up to 100 metric tons at a much lower cost, Starship challenges the old rules. Many mission concepts previously dismissed as too heavy or too complex might now be feasible, not because they've been simplified, but because the mass constraint is finally starting to loosen. The real shift is in how we think about mass. Rather than minimizing it, the new approach is to use mass as a way to reduce complexity, lower mission risk, and enable much more ambitious goals. Starship relies on chemical propulsion and avoids the political hurdles associated with nuclear systems. If it proves flightworthy and capable of soft landing large payloads on Mars, it could open entirely new doors for human exploration. That said, the author is careful to point out that one big problem still looms, water. Back in NASA's 2009 Design Reference Architecture 5.0, Water was identified as one of the three central challenges in any long-duration human Mars mission, alongside the precision landing of heavy payloads and the production of return propellant. SpaceX's current Mars architecture seems to scale up the mission size significantly. They're envisioning sending at least five starships to Mars, each requiring a dozen refueling launches in Earth orbit, which could add up to at least 60 heavy lift launches in total. That's an enormous logistical burden, and more importantly, their plan depends heavily on finding and processing large quantities of Martian water to produce over a thousand tons of return propellant. This essentially restricts potential landing sites to regions around 40 degrees north latitude, where ice is thought to exist. But even there, it's not guaranteed that the water will be accessible or processable. So, instead of going all-in on that high-risk approach, the author proposes a different kind of first mission. One that takes advantage of Starship's capabilities, but avoids its biggest vulnerabilities. The idea is to send a smaller crew, six people instead of twelve, and to land near the Martian equator, where surface conditions are generally better and scientifically more interesting. The crew wouldn't rely on massive infrastructure or unproven water extraction systems. 
Instead of bringing a full-sized starship back from the surface, they'd ascend in a small capsule to a waiting return vehicle already in Mars orbit. By keeping the mission smaller and smarter, only 40 tons of ascent propellant would be needed. And rather than hunting for Martian water, the mission could simply bring 18 tons of water from Earth and react it with 22 tons of Martian carbon dioxide to make the fuel needed for ascent. This not only simplifies the mission enormously, but it also removes the need to land at a site just because it might have ice. In the author's words, it's just like Goldilocks. NASA's porridge is too cold, SpaceX's is too hot. What I propose is just right. Just by doing something as simple as bringing your own water to Mars, which has only recently become feasible thanks to the massive payload capacity of Starship, you not only avoid relying on mining enough Martian water to get back home, but you also gain what the author sees as the most important advantage, freedom in choosing the landing site. Since you don't need local water, you can land almost anywhere on Mars, including right on the equator. That opens up a bunch of benefits. Even though solar power might be just a secondary energy source, it can still be a valuable backup, especially for outlying systems. Temperatures on Mars depend more on thermal inertia than latitude. But all things being equal, it's expected to be warmer near the equator, which means less stress on the thermal and structural design of habitats, rovers, and other infrastructure. There's also the psychological factor. Just seeing the weak sun can make a big difference for the crew. At 40 degrees latitude in winter, the sun only gets about 25 degrees above the southern horizon on December 21st, which isn't great for morale. From an engineering perspective, landing and launching from lower latitudes is easier too. Ascent requires less propellant, and the trajectories for both descent and ascent are more favorable. Plus, since the equator doesn't see big seasonal swings like higher latitudes do, thermal and energy systems can be kept simpler. So, now that you've got the idea and the reasoning behind it, here's how the actual mission would work. As mentioned earlier, the proposed plan is a scaled-down, smarter mission that avoids the need for Martian water entirely. That's a big deal. It not only removes a major technical uncertainty, but it also likely eliminates the need for recycling liquid waste on the surface, which simplifies things even further. In this mission, six astronauts are sent to Mars aboard a SpaceX Starship where they'll live and work on the surface for about 500 days. But when it's time to return, they don't ride the starship back. Instead, they launch in a small ascent capsule and rendezvous with a return vehicle that's already waiting for them in orbit around Mars. That return vehicle then carries them back to Earth. This approach, called DRA-6, Design Reference Architecture 6, offers a huge advantage over older mission concepts. Traditional plans involved launching two fully-fueled starships from Mars back to Earth, but that would require around 2,400 tons of propellant, all of which would have to be either made on Mars or somehow delivered there, a massive logistical and technical challenge. DRA-6, on the other hand, needs just 40 tons of ascent fuel for the small capsule. That's a game-changing reduction in mass and complexity. And instead of relying on extracting water from the Martian subsurface, which may or may not be accessible, the DRA-6 plan brings water from Earth. That water is then used to make the fuel for the ascent capsule. Here's how it works. The mission brings 18 tons of water from Earth. Using electrolysis, that water is split into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen is then combined with carbon dioxide from the Martian atmosphere to produce methane, the same type of fuel that Starship uses. The oxygen from electrolysis is used as the oxidizer. Any water formed during this chemical process gets recycled and used to make more fuel. In the end, 18 tons of Earth-supplied water plus 22 tons of Martian CO2 produce the 40 tons of propellant needed to get the crew off Mars and into orbit. But fuel isn't the only reason you need water. Over a 500-day mission, six astronauts will need about 60 tons of water just for life support, to drink, cook, clean, and stay healthy. There are two options to meet that need. Option one is to bring all 78 tons of water from Earth, 18 tons for ascent fuel and 60 tons for life support. Thanks to Starship's huge payload capacity, that's technically possible, but not ideal. Option two, and the more efficient one, is to combine a smaller Earth-supplied water reserve with a recycling system. 
Just like on the ISS, wastewater, including urine and gray water, would be recycled to reduce the amount of fresh water needed. In this version of the plan, the mission brings enough water from Earth to cover basic survival needs in case the recycling system fails. That comes out to 21 tons, based on a minimum of 7 kilograms of water per crew member per day for 500 days. Then, to raise the crew's water usage to a more comfortable 20 kilograms per person per day, the rest, about 39 tons, would be provided by a 90% efficient recycling system. To make this work, a water recovery unit, estimated at approximately 5 tons, would be included in the Starship payload. Add 4 tons of backup water for the system, and the whole recycling setup adds about 9 tons to the manifest. That brings the total Earth-supplied water and systems mass to about 30 tons, compared to 78 tons without recycling. In the end, when you combine water for fuel and water for life support, you're either sending 48 tons with the recycling system or 78 tons without it. Either way, both options are within Starship's payload capabilities. The author points out that this mission concept assumes there will be some way to transport samples from a wide area of the Martian surface back to the main landing site, where a more advanced lab would be located. But as of now, no such system actually exists. Developing that kind of capability would be a major challenge, especially given Mars's thin atmosphere and rough, unpredictable terrain. An alternative could be deploying long-range rovers based at the main site. These would likely be robotic, equipped with AI for autonomous operation, but still monitored and controlled, at least in part, from the main base. So, what do you think? Could something as simple as bringing your own water really be the key to making the first human mission to Mars work? Let me know in the comments below.